Lev Vygotsky Lev Semyonovic Vygotsky was a Soviet psychologist, the founder of an unfinished Marxist theory of human cultural and biosocial development commonly referred to as cultural historical psychology, a prominent advocate for a science of the Superman, a new psychological theory of consciousness, and leader of the Vygotsky Circle. As a fervent Spinozist in many respects, he was profoundly influenced by Spinoza's thought. Despite his claim for a new psychology that he foresaw as a science of the Superman of the communist future, Vygotsky's main work was in developmental psychology and he proposed a theory of the development of higher psychological functions that saw human psychological development as emerging through interpersonal connections and actions with the social environment. During an earlier mechanistic and reductionist instrumental psychology period of his career, he argued that human psychological development can be formed through the use of meaningless signs that he viewed as psychological equivalent of instrument use in human labor and industry. Later, in the holistic period of his career, Vygotsky rejected his earlier reductionist views on signs. Under the increasing influence from the holistic thinking of the scholars primarily associated with German-American Gestalt psychology movement Vygotsky adopted their views on psychological systems and inspired by Kurt Lewin's topological psychology introduced the vague notion of the zone of proximal development. It was during this period that he identified play of young children as their leading activity, that he understood as the main source of preschoolers' psychological development, which he viewed as the inseparable unity of emotional, volitional, and cognitive development. As early as in mid-1920s, Vygotsky's ideas were introduced in the West, but he remained virtually unknown until the early 1980s when the popularity among educators of the developmental psychology of Jean Piaget started to decline and, in contrast, Vygotsky's notion of the zone of proximal development became a central component of the development of the so-called social constructivist turn in developmental and, primarily, educational psychology and practice. A review of General Psychology Study, published in 2002, ranked Vygotsky as the 83rd top psychologist of the 20th century and the third Russian on the top 100 list after Ivan Pavlov and Vygotsky's longtime collaborator Alexander Luria. The early 21st century has seen scholarly re-evaluations of the popular version of Vygotsky's legacy, which is referred to as the revisionist revolution in Vygotsky studies. The studies conducted in the framework of the revisionist turn in Vygotsky studs in the decade of 2010s revealed not only systematic and massive falsifications and distortions of Vygotsky's legacy, but also demonstrated rapid decrease of this author's popularity in international scholarship that started in 2016 to 2017 and the downfall even further accelerated in 2018. This situation has been described as the Vygotsky bubble and foundational crisis in global Vygotskyna. The reasons of this crisis are not entirely clear yet and are being discussed in scholarly circles. Lev Vygotsky was born to the Vygotsky family in the town of Orsha, Belarus into a non-religious middle-class family of Russian Jewish extraction. His father Simka Vygotsky was a banker. Lev Vygotsky was raised in the city of Gomel, where he was homeschooled until 1911 and then obtained formal degree in a private Jewish gymnasium, which allowed him entrance to a university. In 1913 Lev Vygotsky was admitted to the Moscow University by mere ballot through a Jewish lottery. At the time a 3% Jewish student quota was administered for entry in Moscow and St. Petersburg universities. He had interest in humanities and social sciences, but at the insistence of his parents he applied to the medical school in Moscow University. During the first semester of study he transferred to the law school. There he studied law and, in parallel, he attended lectures at fully official, but privately funded and non-degree granting Shaniavsky Moscow City People's University. His early interests were in the arts and, primarily, in the topics of the history of the Jewish people, the tradition, culture, and Jewish identity. In contrast, during this period he was highly critical of the ideas of both socialism and Zionism, and proposed the solution of the Jewish question by return to the traditional Jewish orthodoxy. Lev Vygotsky never completed his formal studies at the Imperial Moscow University and, thus, he never obtained a university degree, 
his studies were interrupted by the October Bolshevik uprising in 1917 in the country's capital Petrograd and the second largest city Moscow. Following these events, he left Moscow and eventually returned to Gomel, where he lived after the October Socialist Revolution of 1917 occurred. There is virtually no information about his life during the years in Gomel after the German occupation during the WWI, until the Bolsheviks captured the town in 1919. Since then he was an active participant of major social transformation under the Bolshevik rule and a fairly prominent representative of the Bolshevik government in Gomel from 1919 to 1923. By the early 1920s, as reflected in his journalistic publications of the time, he informally changed his Jewish-sounding birth name, Lev Simkhovich Vygotsky, with the surname becoming Vygotsky and the patronymic Simkhovich becoming the Slavic Semyonovuk. It was under this pen name that the fame subsequently came to him. His daughters and other relatives, though, preserved their original family name Vygotsky. The traditional English spelling of his last name nowadays is Vygotsky. In January 1924, Vygotsky took part in the second All-Russian Psychoneurological Congress in Petrograd. After the Congress, Vygotsky received an invitation to become a research fellow at the Psychological Institute in Moscow. Vygotsky moved to Moscow with his new wife, Rosa Smikhova. He began his career at the Psychological Institute as a staff scientist, second class. By the end of 1925, Vygotsky completed his dissertation in 1925 entitled, The Psychology of Art, that was not published until the 1960s and a book entitled, Pedagogical Psychology, that apparently was created on the basis of lecture notes that he prepared in Gomel while he was a psychology instructor at local educational establishments. In summer 1925 he made his first and only trip abroad to a London Congress on the Education of the Deaf. Upon return to the Soviet Union, he was hospitalized due to relapse of tuberculosis and, having miraculously survived, would remain an invalid and out of job until the end of 1926. His dissertation was accepted as the prerequisite of scholarly degree, which was awarded to Vygotsky in fall 1925 in absentia. After his release from hospital Vygotsky did theoretical and methodological work on the crisis in psychology, but never finished the draft of the manuscript and interrupted his work on it around mid-1927. The manuscript was published later with notable editorial interventions and distortions in 1982 and presented by the editors as one of the most important Vygotsky's works. In this early manuscript, Vygotsky argued for the formation of a general psychology that could unite the naturalist objectivist strands of psychological science with the more philosophical approaches of Marxist orientation. However, he also harshly criticized those of his colleagues who attempted to build a Marxist psychology as an alternative to the naturalist and philosophical schools. He argued that if one wanted to build a truly Marxist psychology, there were no shortcuts to be found by merely looking for applicable quotes in the writings of Marx. Rather one should look for a methodology that was in accordance with the Marxian spirit. In 1926-30 Vygotsky worked on a research program investigating the development of higher cognitive functions of logical memory, selective attention, decision-making, and language comprehension, from early forms of primal psychological functions. During this period he gathered a group of collaborators including Alexander Luria, Boris Varshava, Alexei Leontiev, Leonid Zankov, and several others. Vygotsky guided his students in researching this phenomenon from three different perspectives. In the early 1930s Vygotsky experienced deep crisis, personal and theoretical, and after a period of massive self-criticism made an attempt at a radical revision of his theory. The work of the representatives of the Gestalt psychology and other holistic scholars was instrumental in this theoretical shift. In 1932-1934 Vygotsky was aiming at establishing a psychological theory of consciousness, but because of his death this theory remained only in a very sketchy and unfinished form. Vygotsky was a pioneering psychologist and his major works span six separate volumes, written over roughly ten years, from psychology of art to thought and language. Vygotsky's interests in the fields of developmental psychology, child development, and education were extremely diverse. <laughs>
His philosophical framework includes interpretations of the cognitive role of mediation tools, as well as the reinterpretation of well-known concepts in psychology such as internalization of knowledge. Vygotsky introduced the notion of zone of proximal development, a metaphor capable of describing the potential of human cognitive development. His work covered topics such as the origin and the psychology of art, development of higher mental functions, philosophy of science and the methodology of psychological research, the relation between learning and human development, concept formation, interrelation between language and thought development, play as a psychological phenomenon, learning disabilities and abnormal human development. His scientific thinking underwent several major transformations throughout his career, but generally Vygotsky's legacy may be divided into two fairly distinct periods, and the transitional phase between the two during which Vygotsky experienced the crisis in his theory and personal life. These are the mechanistic instrumental period of the 1920s, integrative holistic period of the 1930s, and the transitional years of, roughly, 1929 to 1931. Each of these periods is characterized by its distinct themes and theoretical innovations. Vygotsky studied child development and the significant roles of cultural mediation and interpersonal communication. He observed how higher mental functions developed through these interactions, and also represented the shared knowledge of a culture. This process is known as internalization. Internalization may be understood in one respect as knowing how. For example, the practices of riding a bicycle or pouring a cup of milk initially, are outside and beyond the child. The mastery of the skills needed for performing these practices occurs through the activity of the child within society. A further aspect of internalization is appropriation, in which children take tools and adapt them to personal use, perhaps using them in unique ways. Internalizing the use of a pencil allows the child to use it very much for personal ends rather than drawing exactly what others in society have drawn previously. In 1930s Vygotsky was engaged in massive reconstruction of his theory of his instrumental period of the 1920s. Around 1929 to 1930 he realized numerous deficiencies and imperfections of the earlier work of the Vygotsky circle and criticized it on a number of occasions, in 1929, 1930, in 1931, and in 1932. Specifically, Vygotsky criticized his earlier idea of radical separation between the lower and higher psychological functions and, around 1932, appears to abandon it. Vygotsky's self-criticism was complemented by external criticism for a number of issues, including the separation between the higher and the lower psychological functions, impracticality and inapplicability of his theory in social practices during the time of rapid social change, and vulgar Marxist interpretation of human psychological processes. Critics also pointed to his overemphasis on the role of language and, on the other hand, the ignorance of the emotional factors in human development. Major figures in Soviet psychology such as Sergei Rubinstein criticized Vygotsky's notion of mediation and its development in the works of students. Following criticism and in response to generous offer from the highest officials in Soviet Ukraine, a major group of Vygotsky's associates, the members of the Vygotsky Circle, including Luria, Mark Lebedinsky, and Leontiev, moved from Moscow to Ukraine to establish the Kharkov School of Psychology. In the second half of the 1930s, Vygotsky was criticized again for his involvement in the cross-disciplinary study of the child known as pathology and uncritical borrowings from contemporary bourgeois science. Considerable critique came from the alleged Vygotsky's followers, such as Leontiev and members of his research group in Kharkov. Much of this early criticism was later discarded by these Vygotskyan scholars as well. The period of major revision of Vygotsky's theory and its transition from mechanist orientation of his 1920s to integrative holistic science of the 1930s. During this period Vygotsky was under particularly strong influence of holistic theories of German-American group of proponents of Gestalt psychology, most notably, the peripheral participants of the Gestalt movement Kurt Goldstein and Kurt Lewin. However, Vygotsky's work of this period remained largely fragmentary and unfinished and, therefore, unpublished. 
Zone of proximal development is Vygotsky's term for the range of tasks that a child is in the process of learning to complete. In the original Vygotsky's writings this phrase is used in three different meanings. Vygotsky viewed the ZPD as a better way to explain the relation between children's learning and cognitive development. Prior to the ZPD, the relation between learning and development could be boiled down to the following three major positions, 1. Development always precedes learning, children first need to meet a particular maturation level before learning can occur, 2. Learning and development cannot be separated, but instead occur simultaneously, essentially, learning is development, and 3. Learning and development are separate, but interactive processes, one process always prepares the other process, and vice versa. Vygotsky rejected these three major theories because he believed that learning should always precede development in the ZPD. According to Vygotsky, through the assistance of a more capable person, a child is able to learn skills or aspects of a skill that go beyond the child's actual developmental or maturational level. The lower limit of ZPD is the level of skill reached by the child working independently. The upper limit is the level of potential skill that the child is able to reach with the assistance of a more capable instructor. In this sense, the ZPD provides a prospective view of cognitive development, as opposed to a retrospective view that characterizes development in terms of a child's independent capabilities. Perhaps Vygotsky's most important contribution concerns the interrelationship of language development and thought. This problem was explored in Vygotsky's book, Thinking and Speech, entitled in Russian, Mishleni i Reg, that was published in 1934. In fact, this book was a mere collection of essays and scholarly papers that Vygotsky wrote during different periods of his thought development and included writings of his instrumental and holistic periods. Vygotsky never saw the book published, it was published posthumously, edited by his closest associates not sooner than December, 1934, i.e., half a year after his death. First English translation was published in 1962 heavily abbreviated and under an alternative and incorrect translation of the title Thought and Language for the Russian title Myslii Azyk. The book establishes the explicit and profound connection between speech, and the development of mental concepts and cognitive awareness. Vygotsky described inner speech as being qualitatively different from verbal external speech. Although Vygotsky believed inner speech developed from external speech via a gradual process of internalization, with younger children only really able to think out loud, he claimed that in its mature form, inner speech would not resemble spoken language as we know it. Hence, thought itself developing socially. Vygotsky died of tuberculosis on June 11, 1934, at the age of 37, in Moscow, Soviet Union. One of Vygotsky's last private notebook entries gives a proverbial, yet very pessimistic self-assessment of his contribution to psychological theory. This is the final thing I have done in psychology and I will like Moses die at the summit, having glimpsed the promised land but without setting foot on it. Farewell, dear creations. The rest is silence. Immediately after his death, Vygotsky was proclaimed one of the leading psychologists in the Soviet Union, although his stellar reputation was somewhat undermined by the decree of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of 1936 that denounced the mass movement, discipline, and related social practice of the so-called pedology. Yet, even despite some criticisms and censorship of his works most notably, in the post-Stalin era in the Soviet Union of 1960s to 1980s by his Russian alleged and self-proclaimed best students and followers Vygotsky always remained among the most quoted scholars in the field and has become a cult figure for a number of contemporary intellectuals and practitioners in Russia and the international psychological and educational community alike. In the Soviet Union, the work of the group of Vygotsky's students known as the Vygotsky Circle was vital for preserving and, in many respects, distorting the scientific legacy of Lev Vygotsky. The members of the group subsequently laid a foundation for Vygotsky and psychology's systematic development in such diverse fields as the psychology of memory, perception, sensation, and movement, personality, will and volition, psychology of play and psychology of learning, as well as the theory of step-by-step -step formation of mental actions, 
General Psychological Activity Theory and Psychology of Action. Andrei Puzyri elaborated the ideas of Vygotsky in respect of psychotherapy and even in the broader context of deliberate psychological intervention, in general. In Laszlo Garay founded a Vygotskyan research group. In North America, Vygotsky's work was known from the end of the 1920s through a series of publications in English, but it did not have a major impact on research in general. In 1962 a translation of his posthumous 1934 book, Thinking and Speech, published with the title Thought and Language, did not seem to change the situation considerably. It was only after an eclectic compilation of partly rephrased and partly translated works of Vygotsky and his collaborators, published in 1978 under Vygotsky's name as Mind in Society, that the Vygotsky boom started in the West, originally, in North America, and later, following the North American example, spread to other regions of the world. This version of Vygotskyan science is typically associated with the names of its chief proponents Michael Cole, James Vertsk, their associates and followers, and is relatively well known under the names of cultural historical activity theory or yet more distant from Vygotsky's legacy activity theory. Scaffolding, a concept introduced by Wood, Bruner and Ross in 1976, is somewhat related to the idea of ZPD, although Vygotsky never used the term. A critique of the North American interpretation of Vygotsky's ideas and, somewhat later, its global spread and dissemination appeared in the 1980s. The early 1980s criticism of Russian and Western Vygotskyan scholars continued throughout the 1990s. Thus, different authors emphasized the biased and fragmented interpretations of Vygotsky by representatives of what was termed neo-Vygotskyan fashions in contemporary psychology or selective traditions in Vygotskyan scholarship. Characteristically, the most fashionable Vygotskyan phraseology in wide circulation in Western scholarly and educational discourse such as the so-called zone of proximal development in the critical literature of this period were referred to as one of the most used and least understood constructs to appear in contemporary educational literature, the construct that was used as little more than a fashionable alternative to Piagetian terminology or the concept of IQ for describing individual differences in attainment or potential. Other authors also suggest clearly distinguishing between Vygotsky's original notion of Zona Blazatia Gorashvataya and its later Western superficial interpretations known under the umbrella term, Zone of Proximal Development. The criticism continued and reached a peak in the 2000s. Most often these critiques address numerous distortions of Vygotsky's ideas, mere declarations of faith, versions of Vygotsky, the concepts and inferences curiously attributed to Lev Vygotsky, multiple readings of Vygotsky, some of which for instance, activity theory are referred to as dead end for cultural historical psychology and, moreover, for methodological thinking in cultural psychology. Some publications question if anyone actually reads Vygotsky's words, whether it is too late to understand Vygotsky for the classroom, and suggest turning Vygotsky on his head. Inconsistencies, contradictions and at times fundamental flaws in Vygotskyan literature were revealed in the ocean of critical publications on this subject and are typically associated with but certainly not limited to the North American legacy of Michael Cole and James Vertsk and their associates. These criticisms contributed significantly to the increasing awareness of numerous challenges of claiming a Vygotskyan perspective. Critical analysis of Vygotsky's ideas revealed that the alleged Vygotsky's theory of play never existed as such, instead, it was proposed that Vygotsky's brief writings about play do not constitute a theory according to scientific definitions of psychological theory, and would be better acknowledged merely as part of the historical evolution of ideas about children's play. Of greater significance is that the theoretical relevance of Vygotsky's opinion about play can seriously be called into question upon the basis of current research in the area. In addition, recent studies discuss highly problematic nature of Vygotsky's theorizations from contemporary linguistic standpoint, reveal the author's conceptual flaws and propose alternative sources of inspiration in psycholinguistic research in lieu of Vygotsky's conceptualizations it is shown that some of Vygotsky's observations are problematic but that, even if they are accepted, Vygotsky's theoretical account suffers from fundamental difficulties.
thus the support claimed from Vygotsky in accounts of second language acquisition is misplaced, first because of those difficulties and, second, because many who claim support from Vygotsky, do not need or even use his theory but instead focus their attention on his empirical observations and assume incorrectly that if their own empirical observations match Vygotsky's, then Vygotsky's theory can be accepted. The revisionist movement in Vygotsky studies was termed a revisionist revolution to describe a relatively recent trend that emerged in the 1990s. This trend is typically associated with growing dissatisfaction with the quality and scholarly integrity of available texts of Vygotsky and members of Vygotsky circle, including their English translations made from largely mistaken, distorted, and even in a few instances falsified Soviet editions, which raises serious concerns about the reliability of Vygotsky's texts available in English. However, unlike critical literature that discusses Western interpretations of Vygotsky's legacy, the target of criticism and the primary object of research in the studies of the revisionist strand are Vygotsky's texts proper, the manuscripts, original lifetime publications, and Vygotsky's posthumous Soviet editions that most often were subsequently uncritically translated into other languages. The revisionist strand is solidly grounded in a series of studies in Vygotsky's archives that uncovered previously unknown and unpublished Vygotsky materials. Thus, some studies of the revisionist strand show that certain phrases, terms, and expressions typically associated with Vygotskyan legacy as its core notions and concepts such as cultural historical psychology, cultural historical theory, cultural historical school, higher psychical slash mental functions, internalization, zone of proximal development, etc., in fact, either occupy not more than just a few dozen pages within the six-volume collection of Vygotsky's works, or never even occur in Vygotsky's own writings. Another series of studies revealed the questionable quality of Vygotsky's published texts that, in fact, were never finished and intended for publication by their author, but were nevertheless posthumously published without giving proper editorial acknowledgement of their unfinished, transitory nature, and with numerous editorial interventions and distortions of Vygotsky's text. Another series of publications reveals that another well-known Vygotsky's text that is often presented as the foundational work was back-translated into Russian from an English translation of a lost original and passed for the original Vygotsky's writing. This episode was referred to as benign forgery. Scholars associated with the revisionist movement in Vygotsky studies propose returning to Vygotsky's original uncensored works, critically revising the available discourse, and republishing them in both Russian and translation with a rigorous scholarly commentary. Therefore, an essential part of this revisionist strand is the ongoing work on Cyanima Complete Vygotsky project that for the first time ever exposes full collections of Vygotsky's texts, uncensored and cleared from numerous mistakes, omissions, insertions, and blatant distortions and falsifications of the author's text made in Soviet editions and uncritically transferred in virtually all foreign translated editions of Vygotsky's works. This project is carried out by an international team of volunteers researchers, archival workers, and library staff from Belarus, Brazil, Canada, Israel, Italy, the Netherlands, Russia, and Switzerland who joined their efforts and put together a collection of L.S. Vygotsky's texts. This publication work is supported by a stream of critical scholarly studies and publications on textology, history, theory, and methodology of Vygotskyan research that cumulatively contributes to the first-ever edition of the complete works of L.S. Vygotsky. Primary Secondary